He's like, yeah. I'm going to rain down fire and yeah, take away your crops and you're going to eat your own babies. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess they didn't have to do it, but come on, Satan, Satan and Jesus boxing. You shut your face. I wrote the book, you know, you know, but I can't ground my instantiation of the necessary preconditions <laughs> that provide the possibilities of impossible, all possibilities of all being. So, yeah, well, Justin, let me tell you, uh, you know, here, uh, here, here, you're uh, one of these atheists, I understand. And, uh, you know, uh, you don't realize this, but uh, your your father was uh, obviously soup. Okay. Welcome back to the Deconstruction Zone. It's my pleasure today to present an interview that I was able to get with Dr. Joshua Bowen. However, before we start the interview, I want to let everyone know that we're going to have links to his social media handles and to his current works in the descriptions of this video. So if you want to connect with him on TikTok or on his YouTube and you want to get a hold of his works, An Atheist Guide to the Old Testament and Did the Old Testament Endorse Slavery, I highly recommend clicking those links in the description of this video. And with that, I hope that you have as much fun watching this interview as I had conducting it. Dr. Joshua Bowen, the world-renowned Dr. Joshua Bowen, Welcome to Deconstruction Zone. <laughs> world renowned. I mean, I guess there's somewhere in the world that I am renowned. So, you know, well, well, you know what? Let's go with it. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> in the world of deconstruction, you might be the most famous of the, the scholars. Oh, um, gosh. And because you're talking about a lot of the topics that people are curious about. Um, so we really appreciate that. Now, uh, before we get into any of the questioning or your background, or anything like that. I've got one very important question, which is why are you suppressing the truth in unrighteousness? <laughs> you know, I just want to sin, Justin. That's what I want to do, right? I know that all of this stuff is true, but uh, I, you know, I I really want to, you know, I really want to have gay sex. So that's, that's <laughs> I what it's all about. You know what I mean? So. I understand. Well, the, you know, listen, the, uh, the body was made in such a way. <laughs> So, Dr. Josh, um, you have uh, not just a Bible college degree, not just uh, attending uh, an actual evangelical uh, seminary, uh, but also a PhD. Can you uh, fill in the audience for those who don't already know you, uh, what your credentials are? Sure. Yeah, so I got my bachelor's in uh, religion from Liberty University for those of you that don't know, is not the most liberal school you could attend. And uh, following that, I got commissioned in the Air Force to start their chaplain candidate program. And in so doing, I enrolled at uh, what was then Capital Bible Seminary, which has now become part of Lancaster Bible College and Seminary. And I studied there for six years full time and got a master's in theology, which ended up being like 126 semester hours. I wrote my thesis there on the meaning of the divine name El Shaddai. And then because of my good GPA and my history there at, at, at the university with, with my academics, whatever, I, I was able to, I was very fortunate to get a spot at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in their ancient Near Eastern studies program. I studied under Paul Del Nero and Jake Lounger, uh, um, others, Ted Lewis and Kyle McCarter and you know, Betsy Bryan and Richard Jasnow. And I dug at uh, the site of Umal Mara with Glenn Schwartz, which was, was very, very fortunate to be asked to go out there. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Anyway, so I, I was there until I graduated with my PhD in Assyriology which is the study of the languages and cultures of ancient Iraq. But because of my background, every year I took uh, courses in Hebrew Bible. So I got a minor in Hebrew Bible while I was there. So that's sort of my, that's sort of my thing. Uh, I did the typical evangelical thing where I, I finished, you know, my old Testament stuff at my evangelical seminary and said, well, gosh, like I don't need to study more Hebrew. I already know Hebrew. Let me do one of these adjacent fields so that I got, I got like both punches, right? Because who needs to study that critical scholarship stuff? That's it's a bunch of hooey. So, of course. And obviously, when you went out to do your research, it was what a Bible in one hand, a spade in the other, and you were gonna <laughs> you're gonna prove the Bible to be true. That was it. And it's interesting because you know people that people that know me are 
bored of hearing this, I'm sure. But, you know, when, when I, I taught Hebrew for two years, uh, my last two years at, at seminary. And, you know, the dean of, of students came up and he, he said, so you've, you've got this scholarship to Hopkins. Are, are you nervous at all? Because that's like a very liberal school. And I held up my, I just finished teaching my last Hebrew Bible class. So I held up my BHS and uh, I said, well, I'm going into the lion's den, but I'm going to win souls for Christ, you know? And yeah, I deconverted like halfway through the first semester. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, it, it happens pretty quick. And I, I think when you're studying the manuscripts, uh, like the, there's so much deconstruction that starts just going through the BHS. Yeah. Because like when I first learned Hebrew um, in Bible college, I really wanted to study the what we would call the original manuscripts. Obviously, there are no originals. Um, but I was kind of dismayed at the number of textual variants. And some of them were pretty significant variants. And this started me thinking like, well, if it's possible that we don't technically know what was absolutely written in the text, then we might need to tone down a little bit on, well, we can interpret everything in this text because of this one specific word. It has this one specific meaning. Because How dare we, you, sir? <laughs> it might be true that that one specific word wasn't even in the original text. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's all it's all so much fun. I know. We and I gave through. my first BHS away to a friend of mine when he entered Bible college. And now right. we're both stone cold atheists. <laughs> the irony, the irony. So you've got a, a fantastic set of credentials. Um, I want to ask a little bit about your background as a Christian, because I know we all come from different experiences. Um, did you grow up in the faith? Was this part of your life or, or did you come to it later? Yeah, so my in my family was and remains really fundamentalist evangelical. So my my grandfather was the one that led me to Christ when I was five. And there aren't I, I have multiple sclerosis, so my memory is sort of shitty at this point. But there are certain, you know, milestones that that sort of stick in my brain no matter what happens. And getting saved was that was one of them. I remember sitting on my bed, you know, and, and my grandfather telling me, yeah. yeah. If you don't if you don't trust in Christ for your salvation, you're you're destined for hell. You know, I have a six year old now. Like, uh, mm. I, I I have the whole spectrum of kids, right? I've got three year old twins. I got a six year old, and then I have an eleven year old and a seventeen year old. And the thought of saying to a five year old, "If you don't do X, you're going to hell," it's like, oh my god. But it worked, you know. <laughs> for I guess for those of you that need your kids to get saved. That'll do it. Yeah. Uh, that brings up uh, maybe a small sidebar, which is um, do you, the gospel message, which it, it essentially boils down to um, there's a right path and the wrong path leads you to damnation. And it's eternal. There's no, you can't reverse it. Does that hit differently as a father than it did when you were younger? I mean, it certainly does in the sense that I, it's, I'm very aware now of the problematic effects that that message has so you know so that i guess it's clear for everybody the the form of evangelicalism that uh, that i got saved under uh, it sounds so strange now uh was you know we were we were sinners because of the sin nature that we got from adam however that happened that was all debated uh but I, I came down on federal headship, but whatever. And, you know, because of that sin nature, there was, we couldn't, we couldn't be with a holy and righteous God in eternity. And so there was, there was no hope, right? Uh, we, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't work our own salvation. We couldn't, we couldn't do enough good to cancel out the bad, uh, which is why Jesus Christ, who came and lived a sinless life. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he he gave up his life on uh, Calvary to pay for our sins as the perfect sacrifice. And, you know, if we trusted in Jesus Christ for our salvation, that righteousness got imputed to our account and we were justified 
before a holy God. And from that point forward, you know, we try to bring our sanctification in line with our justification, but we were a once saved, always saved group. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as it, I would say that my family probably considers me now just very backslidden. Oh yeah. Because once saved, always saved, you're not really yeah. an atheist because they know for a fact you were a Christian, which yeah. means it's just a matter of time before you come back. Yeah. So, which, yeah, that, that, that hurts in and of itself, I think. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I always, we were talking about before we went live but, or before we went, started recording, but you know, I always get a kick out of people that I had somebody say to me this week, uh, in, in thinkers live stream, you know, you, uh, brother, you need to, you need to get saved because you, you know, you're never born again. Okay. My friend, I could run the gospel around you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not a flex on my part. It's just, I've been very fortunate to have that educational experience. So like miss me with that shit. <laughs> I had seminary professors that would, um, one of them showed us a, a, a letter he would get. He got the same letter from the same person every single year. Mm. And it was a guy in, in our town, um, who was a King James onlyist. And every year he sent the same letter to this professor saying, if you don't start teaching from the King James Bible, you're destined to go to hell because, <laughs> because uh, fundamentalism takes many roots, but every root is toxic. <laughs> yes, no doubt. I always like asking the King James only about unicorns. Oh yeah. They have no idea what to do with that. <laughs> or, um, my whipping boy for the King James only is, is trying to help them to understand that the King James translators didn't know what to do with Asherah or Asherot. And they just keeps tra they translated into a grove of trees every time because they don't really know what the word means. All right. Well, I, you know, it's funny. There's a guy that I talk to from time to time who's a really nice guy, but he's convinced that Jesus spoke English. Oh, they had to have, right? Because he, he goes by the King James Bible and that's I mean, it. So. If it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> so I'm terrible. going to. <laughs> so, were there any pivotal uh, pivotal moments in your um, in your journey where you, where it it was less of like, well, this is what I grew up with, and more of like, this is now Jesus becoming real in my life. Mm. I would say that there was never really a time that I can remember where I practiced like an extrinsic religiosity. And I, I, it was, it was always the core of my being. So there wasn't, you know, the, uh, I, I wasn't a Sunday Christian. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that looking back, there were from a behavioral standpoint, some benefits to that. But I mean, it gave me, it gave me the kind of security that I, like I, I don't know that I could find elsewhere, which sucks, right? Because, because it's, if it's so central to who you are and the book becomes the measuring stick against which you, you measure anything and everything that you do or think or say, you know, while it can be restricting in that sense, it's also a very freeing thing because it's like, okay, I don't know a lot of things to be true, but I know that this is true, right? So I, like, I, it's like I have this skeletal frame upon which I can put this piece of flesh or that piece of flesh, but this is the stuff that I know to be true. And so when I deconverted, it was a really, really difficult time for me because, I mean, as, as I'm sure so many people have experienced that are listening, you know, how do you, how do you set morality now? Right. Right. Where do you plant the flag? What, yeah. Right. So like trying to figure out things like, all right, well, what do I, what do I think now about the LGBTQ in a plus community? Mm -hmm. Because like before that was all settled for me. And of course the answer became, you know, abundantly clear immediately. But, uh, the problem that I struggled with was 
the residual feeling of angst and discomfort for because because that is a and I'm not a like a physical biologist like uh, but you know like it, it seems like those are habituated tendencies things that ruts that kind of get dug into your mm-hmm. your neuro pathways or whatever so that it it took it took a lot of time to not be uncomfortable around somebody in the LGBTQ community and then even more time to realize oh wait like I'm a part of that community so hey there you go right so yeah it's um it's been so I would say my my milestones or my pivotal moments weren't interestingly enough like in my during my Christian walk because that was pretty consistent throughout it was in those as you know again I'm sure so many people have in those in those years following right right did you when you were deconstructing from the faith uh or even while you were you were still a practicing you know evangelical do you feel like there was a, a motivation uh via like the fear of hell at all to maintain a particular like hold the line type of attitude like i could be wrong but the consequences are so severe i have to keep doing this thing or i would say that 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 came after my deconstruction because like during during the time that that first semester there at hopkins when i was just being bombarded with ancient near eastern data oh yeah you're in the lion's den there Uh, yeah that's right and the lions ate me you know (laughs) damn it um but i think once the smoke sort of cleared then reality sort of set in that shit like i'm being honest painfully honest with the information that i've been presented with and i I mean i fought my deconstruction tooth and nail i remember having conversations with kyle mccarter after after class or you know during breaks or something and i'd say isn't it possible that like the hobby rue couldn't that be like couldn't that be abraham's descendants like right. isn't he and he would very kindly go well probably not <laughs> i i feel that deeply because when when i was deconstructing i really went down um and went through the amarna tablets and i went through all the historicity of the hobby and i'm thinking like yep man, there seems to be some points of connection here. Like it, it can't just all be fiction. Right. Yeah. Um, but then, if, you know, like a lot of us, it's a death by a thousand paper cuts, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that, you know, I went on Seth Andrews live. It was about three years ago now, I guess. And there was a, a, a researcher that had called in and she was talking about, the, the psychological effects of teachings about hell. And I called in as like a, like an actual, not as a guest, but, you know, but like a, somebody phoning in, you know, <laughs> and like Seth and I are very good friends. He does all the audio book. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he reads all of our audio books. Oh yeah. He does a great and, job too, by the way. Yeah. He's, he's, he's amazing. If you, if, if you get the book just for his voice, I won't be offended. But, you know, I called in and I, I said, I'll be honest, like, and I still struggle with this, right? And it's been, gosh, it's been 15 years. And I, it gets less and less as time goes by. But I mean, there are still, look, if there's one thing that a PhD teaches you or a graduate school teaches you is that you're a dumbass, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yep, 100%. It, when I hear people like in that thinker live, you know, the, the, those kids that are coming in there, those guys that are coming in and they're like full chested, you know, here's what this is. And this is why you guys are wrong. It's like, yeah, I know you've never studied this stuff because um, once you get into it, you realize, holy shit, there is so much here. There's no way I'm ever going to know it. I'm so dumb. Right. right. And all of your professors, like all of my professors would have had a similar opinion. Like, like this is seems to be what the data is suggesting 
but like we're all grappling with this as well. Like the yeah. only people that think they have it all figured out are the people who didn't go to school because yeah. they don't know what they don't know. I used to I used to say with some regularity, uh, if you think it's simple, you probably don't understand the data, right? Yeah, and and I I think that I think that for me that carried over into my deconstruction because it was like shit. Like, I mean. I, I, I could be wrong, right? There there might be something out there. And I still like periodically find myself thinking, maybe maybe I, maybe I should pray again. Just to, you know, just to like just to check, you know? Right. And I actually have. Um and it always ends in the same way. Right. And it sucks. Like the whole thing sucks. I, I envy my 17-year-old, honestly. Right. Because very very intelligent and she's been raised in a it's not an atheist household because my wife is an anglican right yeah right? and i if anybody doesn't know watching megan lewis the host of bart airman's uh misquoting jesus podcast that's i'm i'm married to her I made I am sure now Megan Lewis's husband. That's how I should have introduced myself <laughs> I made sure to introduce you by your name not Megan Lewis's <laughs> husband <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Megan's an Anglican, and believe me when I tell you, Megan's smart as hell. Yeah. Now she's she's in no way uh, anything like an evangelical Christian, right? So, um, you know, that, that like, yeah. but the point is that, like, could there be a God? Like, fuck if I know. Yeah. Fuck if I know. That's not my field, right? I'm not in philosophy of religion. I'm a I'm a a philologist right so you know it, it it is difficult but i think you know in my in my lucid moments it's like okay if there is a god it seems very strange to think that first of all i know it's not this god right right <laughs> right because right. uh, th th these these texts look conspicuously like other texts from the ancient near east my 17 year old i mean like when i she knows the gospel like mm -hmm. she she she's told it to my family members before who have like tried to come at her with it and she and, and i'll ask her like privately hey you know you you could believe what you want to believe obviously like i just want you to be a critical thinker but like what do you think about this and she goes dad it just it sounds so weird <laughs> right right <laughs> Well, let me ask yeah. you a question because you're on the obviously the other side of the deconstruction. Have you found it to be uh, difficult or challenging to uh, refocus like your life's purpose? Because when you're a Christian, your purpose in life is given to you. But when you're on the other side, it's a little different story. Yeah, I think I, I do think that. Kohelet hits a lot harder now, right? Because, right. you know, so many people struggle with reading Ecclesiastes because, you know, where's God and all? Oh, okay, he's at the very end here, tacked on, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> but why are they quoting, you know, like a section of Gilgamesh in here, right? This is this is totally weird, the message, you know, make it you know, seize the day. Right, right. Make, the, make the most of what you've got and live every moment. And you know that's that's a difficult message. While it's a wonderful message, it's it's very difficult coming out of this, coming out of this life where I welcomed death. Mm, right, right. Because you knew there was a second life at the other end. That's right. And you know when. When you think about, you know, those questions that, that you always get asked when you're in like Sunday school, if you, you know, if somebody came into your church and you know, held a gun to your head and said, denounce Jesus, you know, yeah. and we're all like, of course we would die for our Lord, you know, and you're <laughs> like, eh, would you though? Right. Um, you know, that, that, that type of security where come what may, God is in control, it has unquestionably left a void mm -hmm. that i mean like i i struggle i i struggle with it because you know now you think things like 
I mean, outside of the simple things like, hey, we need to take care of our planet. Sure. <laughs> right? Sure. Which is something that as a fundamentalist, we were like, you know. God's got it. Yeah. I mean, well, this place has got to go before God comes back. So, you know, we, let's mess it up enough, right? Let's accelerate the process. Yeah, and for that's sure. Right. Uh, the plane's going down. Why are we fixing the, fixing the UHF radio? You know, but you know, now, now it really is like, I want to, I want to do the best that I can by my kids and my wife and, yeah. and my family. And yeah, finding, finding purpose in being the person that I want to look back at the end of my life and be proud of. Right. Yeah. But it's difficult. And there's no question it's difficult. Did you find any assistance during your deconstruction process from either like friends or family members or former professors that tried to, uh, we'll say, provide some answers to your questions? And were any of those answers helpful? Yeah, there was one. So I, because I deconstructed at the beginning of my doctoral program, you know, 65 hours a week of study doesn't really lend itself to having a lot of free time to, to grapple with, you know, these other issues. But my friend, Mark, who I, I went through seminary with him and he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he, he remains an evangelical Christian mm -hmm. and, you know, he came up, he drove up into Baltimore every week every Thursday night after my epigraphy class with Colin McCarter. And he took me out to Uno's pizzeria and we got a pizza and we talked and then we went and got a coffee and walked around Delicate City. And we just talked about, you know, well, isn't it, it isn't it possible that that phrase, <laughs> isn't it possible that? Yeah. And, this is something that I think it's probably really important to recognize, at least about me, but I suspect about a lot of people that have gone down this path. When I had my encounter, shall we say, with your good buddy, Darth Dawkins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're so really the, tight. The, yeah. <laughs> the, thing that, the thing that kept coming back up over and over again was how do you know God doesn't exist? And I would say, well, I don't know God doesn't exist. Right, right. And right. he would say, well, why do you believe God doesn't exist? Oh, okay. And so I'd start talking about the comparable ancient Near Eastern material. And he would say at the end, yeah, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't ex exist. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Uh, what? And then he would go through the whole thing again. And it was just like, I, I'm not here. I am an atheist right but i'm not a philosopher right and so like when people say things like i'm an atheist spokesperson or i'm a talking head atheist or any of this nonsense like i, I like i i'm not qualified to be that right what i am is sort of a fact checker in right. this community right and where i end up is look i'm looking i'm looking at the data and in the same way that every evangelical would say, outside of their own Christian faith, Islam doesn't look right, or the worship of Enlil doesn't look right, right? There are, there are things that it seems man-made. It seems like it's a product of its environment. It does not seem to be of divine origin. Mm. These are the ways that I, that I think about the Bible. And on the one hand, it's been obviously, as we've been talking about, very painful. But on the other hand, it's very freeing because now I get to think about it like I think about all the other ancient Near Eastern texts, which is this is a really cool, you know, piece of artistry, right? That's been that's been compiled and edited and probably re-edited over time in such a way that it can give us a really good, some really good insights into, into our past. And, but I don't, like, I don't have to, I don't have to wrestle with the same things. Right. You, know, you don't have to wrestle with the same things. I suspect that you used to wrestle with and no, um, 
Yeah. So when you're I, a Christian, you have to ask yourself, what does this mean? What What is God telling me through this text? Yeah. Which is a very difficult thing to, when you have an ambiguous text that you don't fully understand anyways, because you didn't study the ancient Near East, how do you, yeah. how does God talk to you through that? You know? Yeah, that's right. So... Did you find that studying the ancient Near Eastern texts, um, when you first started to do it, did you find that to be um, encouraging to your faith or discouraging? Because I know I've, I've heard mixed opinions on this particular point. Yeah. So discouraging for me, immediately very discouraging. I have several friends that uh, are evangelicals that went through one of them went through the Hopkins program with me. Mm. Another went through a just as rigorous program down at University of Texas, Austin. And they're Assyriologists, uh, Hebrew Bible scholars. Like, one's an Assyriologist, one's a Hebrew Bible scholar. And they're brilliant. Like, there's no question. Yeah. And they're some of my best friends. The reason I think, and I've talked to them, one, ad nauseum, uh, but I've, I've talked to both of them about it. One of the things that I think allowed that allowed that evangelical position to maintain throughout their studies was that they went through a non-fundamentalist program leading up to right. their doctoral work and what that does in my experience is it allows you it allows the student to take one problem out at a time Mm -hmm. Right. We're going to take out the problem of the dating of the book of Daniel. There we go. Right. right. Now let's, let's analyze it. What's, what, what's, what's the data around this? Okay. What's possible? What's not possible? How do we reconcile this? Right. Keeping all of that other data in the background, right. As, as things that you're bringing to all of these presuppositions now, or these conclusions that you're bringing to this part problem of Daniel. And then once you come up with a possible solution that you're satisfied is likely enough, you can put that back on the shelf behind you. And you can say, okay, now we're going to look at this one, right? Let's look at the problem of the Philistine showing up in Genesis, right? <laughs> yeah. How can, we, how can we explain this? And by doing that, it does two things. One, it, it, it allows you your brain to engage and and at the end say it's possible that x explains it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to say it's possible that x explains it and to accept it if you're talking about one thing right it's much more difficult when you're talking about 30 things all at once but when you do this where you you say all right i i accept i think this is a decent explanation about the Philistines. You turn it and you put it back on the shelf. Now, when somebody comes to you and says, yeah, but what about the Philistines in Genesis? You don't have to pull that back off the shelf and revisit it because you know in your mind, you've already settled that issue. Right. Right. And unless someone forces you to bring it out, like there's, there's no real reason for you, unless you're inclined to do so, to revisit that. And so it, it makes it, it makes it easier, I think, to then hit these issues when you go through your doctoral work and say, yeah, yeah, I know, like, here we are talking about the Peleset, right? Talking about the Sea Peoples and here on Ramsey the Third, blah, blah, blah. All right, I, yeah, all right, I, but I got that one already. Like, I'm not, right. I got other things to worry about right now. And I, I think that had I had that sort of training, which I, I mean, it's, it's nothing else but apologetics, right? I mean, I guess that's, that's what you call it. It's just more sophisticated apologetics. Right. It, it, it allows you to sort of get through that program in a way that you don't feel like you're being dishonest with yourself. You're just not thoroughly engaging again in each case. And right. for me, that was not what happened, right? It was like everything got put on the table at once. And right. It was like, uh, I mean, okay, sure. I could say that when it says that Belshazzar 
was Nebuchadnezzar's son. I guess I could say that son there means grandson. Of and course. I guess I could assume that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a, a, a daughter that Nabonidus married. I guess, I mean, I guess all those things could, but I mean, when you have to do that with Daniel, you have to do it with the Exodus, you have to do it with the conquest, you have to, like, it's like, uh, let's just take a step back for a second. Is there another model right. that best accounts for these data points? Yeah, you know, or that better accounts for them. So that's what happened to me. Well, that's a good point because there, I, I think a lot of people during the educational process, like there are triggers. Um, and so one of the big triggers for me in my deconstruction journey was the book of Daniel because so much of the New Testament is dependent upon a particular interpretation of the book of Daniel. But um, I had 12 years of Catholic schooling growing up, so I had to read the Apocrypha books, I read the Maccabees. Uh, one through four. And, and so I was kind of familiar with the history. So when I reread and went through Daniel in uh, Bible College and Seminary, it was very difficult to read it with the interpretation that the New Testament was trying to supply for me. Because I'm like, oh, no, no, I, I understand the historical context of this now. This clearly is something happening in the middle of the second century under Antiochus IV. Yes. And yeah. so if that's the case, and if we know that Belshazzar is the son of Nabonidus, because we have that documented in history, then like, well, the New Testament is just wrong. <laughs> and if the New Testament is just wrong, then how can Jesus be the Messiah if he didn't know that this was wrong? Justin, right? you just don't understand the context, okay? <laughs> Gosh. That, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and I had, I had one very blunt uh, teacher in seminary, uh, you probably know David W. Baker. Mm -hmm. um, he graduated from London uh, with his uh, background in uh, Hebrew and Semitics, but he was the one who he just he's so he's so sweet, but just nonchalantly in class was discussing the dating of Daniel, and just kind of clearly laid out why it was written in the second century, most of it, and then just moved on like nothing happened. And people are like looking around at each other like. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like yeah it makes sense to me but All right, got, right there's some follow-up questions i think <laughs> well it's like it's like when i read um tremper longman's mm. i think it was his first commentary on daniel read the introduction and i mean like yeah. i it's been so long so i'm gonna have to paraphrase it but it was essentially like okay look all the data certainly stands of the second century and then he says but I have theological commitment, so I think it's the sixth <laughs> century. It's like, right, right. Is this thing on? Like what? Yeah. Um, I, I could be wrong. Tremper Longman is one of the few scholars that still will hold to a traditional New Testament view of the Book of Daniel, and somehow that it's not just second century propaganda. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think. I mean, I, I can't remember the details of his most recent Daniel commentary, but I, I think that's, I think that's probably representative of his position. All right. I'll have to check back in, uh, with Tremper Longman on his new stuff. I read some of his original, uh, conservative stuff and I, I wasn't so, so like my favorite commentary, even though it's a little bit out of date is the one by John J. Collins. Mm -hmm. And to me, like everything in that commentary series seems to agree with the data that I've been presented with. And, you know, obviously mm -hmm. my set data sets much smaller than yours, but it just makes sense to me. And it's hard for me to point uh, a different date than what is being posited by the mainstream of scholarship. Yeah. And there's a lot of work that's come out recently. There's a monograph on, you know, the, the editorial history, particularly looking at the Aramaic. But, you know, like it, th this, in my opinion, the way that apologetics is moving now is away, away from the Ken Ham, Kent Hovind, mm -hmm. you know, sort of. In fact, David McDonald at a Deep Drinks podcast put out a video, I think it was today or yesterday. And he, he's basically looking at the, like the hip new apologists, right? <laughs> yeah. And like the way that it's going is this move where the, they seem to be engaging with the ancient Near Eastern material. 
So you'll hear things like my, one of the things that I run into all the time now on the topic of slavery is people will say to me, yeah, but don't you know? And like after that, I, I like anything that you say, I'm probably going to say yes. Right. Like on this topic, yes, I probably do. But don't you know that the ancient Near Eastern laws weren't normative legislation? And I just. Yeah, I, I heard that just yesterday. It's like, I do know that. I don't think you know why you're saying that. Right. Or the implications of it. Because when people make that argument, it's like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, right? They they want Yahweh to have given these laws from Mount Sinai. Right. They want that to have been the case. Like if we went back there with the video camera, I, I can't believe I was, I was getting ready to do this. I can't believe I'm really <laughs> old. But like if we went back there with the video camera, it would be like, like they want us to see the cloud. Uh, right. And, and, yeah. and Moses coming down with the bright face and everything. And yet they want to say, but these aren't normative legislation. Well, my guy, <clears throat> you can't have both. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, the reason that, that historical critical scholars are able to say, we don't think that these laws, law collections in the Hebrew Bible are necessarily like legislation for ancient Israel is because we don't think that they were handed down from a deity on a mountain. Right. Like, that, yeah. That's that's like a necess that's a necessary precondition. You know I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Is. It's true because the opposite is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> For the ground of all being. <clears throat> Precisely. But, yeah, but it's it's that move, but the the reason that I bring that up is because positively they are engaging with the data, but they are engaging with the secondary literature. Why are they doing it? That's debated, right. but they do seem to be doing it. I, I have noticed in the slavery discussion in particular that having never seen any of these books that I've cited in my bibliography on social media, all of a sudden people are citing them all the time, you know, and misciting them. Oh. but citing them nonetheless. So like there's an edited volume that Laura Culbertson put together uh, at the Oriental Institute and like on house of slavery in the household. And I cannot tell you how misquoted that oh, book yeah. is, but it's this, it's this little thing. Like there's no way these people just stumbled across that. Right. It's they, they, they read my book or they watched one of my videos. They saw that I cited it. And then it's like, all right, let me go read that and prove him wrong. And they misunderstood it, which I don't blame people that aren't in the field for misunderstanding secondary literature because it's hard. Sure. But, you know, uh, have a little humility. Anyway, but that's the that's the way that it's going. But it's still, it's still apologetics. It's just right. trendy apologetics trying to say, can we, can we make both of these work? Right. Right. And I, I think the other thing that that this viewpoint, this new apologetic does for you, uh, not for you, obviously, but for the people using it, is that it allows them to completely unhitch the most problematic part of the Bible. We don't have to worry about this part anymore. We only have to worry about this other stuff we like. Um, yeah. But the other part that you like thinks that the other part you don't like is authoritative. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I remember somebody saying to me, well, you know, but it, it's not like it's not like these laws were uh, like enforced uh, or, or, you know, I keep saying normative, but that's the that's the term. And and, and and they were just like, you know, it's it's like akin to wisdom. And it's like, yes, OK, so you've read John Walton. I got it. I got right. it. Right. Yeah. He's basing his work on Ann Fitzpatrick McKinley. I got it. I got it. Here's why I don't think she's right. But like you can't read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and walk away going, well, I, I mean, they didn't have to do it, right? Right. It's not like God was like saying you have to do this. These not are like it's it just, was punishable. It's just wisdom. Exactly. No. What? He's like, yeah. I'm going to rain down fire and yeah, take away your crops and you're going to eat your own babies. You know, it's like, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess they didn't have to do it, but uh, sick flex. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, if if it was just um, if it was just a, a log code that was like a a rough sketch for what God wanted, why does He punish you for not following it? It doesn't. The logic doesn't follow. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, altar. I mean, altar. Offer some kind of incense. Right. Do, do, do that. It's like, it's a rough thing. And then not, not Davin be who are like, Hey, what the fuck? And like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we tried. Hey, <laughs> so, anyway, only really nerdy people are going to get that. I'm sorry. I know uh, yeah. if you ever wondered if it was okay to drink before going to church and they'd have an Abu, it might be the, the case against that. Just, just to be safe. <laughs> right. Don't offer any strange fire <laughs> on your, on your, on your incense pans. Um, all right, Josh, I'm going to get to some of our, our questions here. I, cause I, I know you and I could probably talk for a long time on some of these topics and, yeah. uh, the audience will glaze over cause they don't know what's happening, but that we, <laughs> I, I have a couple questions about the experience. Uh, for example, now that you're on the other side, I, you've probably had time to take a clear look now at the past and, and think about a little bit of it. Like, are there things about your Christian walk or about the life that you previously had that like you're, 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 you're still think of it fondly? Like, do you have good memories? Huh. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that I have good memories. I mean, obviously the things, you know, I was part of. You laugh at me, Justin. I'm just gonna hang up. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was, I was part of the power team. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't. But at our church, right? You know, like so, it wasn't like an actual power team because it's Did like you? a a six two, 170 pound guy. He's not really gonna be part of a power team, right? But we popped soda cans and we bent rebar. Mm -hmm. it, sure, it was eighth inch rebar, but you know it was rebar nonetheless. Yes. And, you know, but so you know those sort of community things that we did. Actually, I don't know if you've come across Alan Bondar yet. Mm -hmm. He he did an interview recently on the Myth Vision podcast. I we grew up together. Well, we, we went to church together, and he became uh, a preterist. Um, like a predator's pastor, hardline. And he deconverted, I want to say three or four years ago. And he's just getting ready to publish a book. And it comes out on the 30th. Um, it's like, it's like killing God the easy way. Oh, and it's really good. I wrote the, uh, the, what is it? The foreword for it. And he's, he's a really great guy. And I think it's a, I think it's an excellent book for people that are going through or have gone through what we, what we're talking about here and anyway but alan uh the reason i bring that up is alan and i he was a big karate guy and we did this karate skit to again if you laugh like i i gave you i absolutely I gave you wouldn't. a freebie right on that first one don't laugh at this one the the carmen um uh what was the name of that song uh champion come on Come on, Satan, Satan and Jesus boxing. You shut your face. I wrote the book. You know, you know what I'm saying? That might um, be his corniest video. <laughs> but like, you know, we were demons and, you know, he was Jesus or he was, no, he wasn't Jesus. He was a, he was a Christian and he's trying to break a brick. You know, it's had sin written on the front and he couldn't do it by himself. And then all us demons came up and beat him up. I mean, it was you know, and then you know, it's Alan and I had like a couple hour conversation uh, six months ago or something, just, just reminiscing about all this goofy shit that we did. But, you know, those are fond memories right, right. for me. But I, I will say there are things that I miss. Mm. And there are things that I miss aside from knowing that I was right or mm -hmm. that I am right about something. You know, Megan and I lost a son a couple of years ago. It's terrible. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and I, I went on a radio program 
you know, maybe six months after that with Dr. Michael Brown. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Very Brown. Very familiar with Michael Brown, the uh, king Hebrew apologist. And the thing is, Michael and I are good friends. You know, like, like we did a debate five years ago, and obviously he and I differ on so many things. But, like, you know, the next time I drive past where he's at, I'm, you know, he's a couple of states away from me. I'm probably going to probably gonna pop in. Um, and so I went on his radio show to just sort of talk about one ancient Near Eastern scholar who went one way and another ancient Near Eastern scholar who went the other way. And, you know, the topic of, of Harry came up, our son, and like I cried sure. on his radio program and Michael meant so well in what he said right but what he said was i know you're gonna see him again oh no and the difficulty with that is that i want to believe it sure and, and who i wouldn't? missed that yeah who wouldn't want that yeah I mean, there, there's nothing that can parallel the pain of losing a child. Uh, there's nothing quite like it. Um, the pastor that was at my church that I went to for years, I lost his eldest son. Mm -hmm. And I remember like 10 years after the fact, it was still every conversation I had with him, Daniel came up. Yeah. And it, it baffled me that it, you know, it was, it just, the pain never goes away. And now that I'm a father, I get it. Like the, the pain will never, never go away. And if there was ever a thing that could bring somebody back to the faith, it would be that, that wishful yeah. thought of, well, maybe I'll see him again. Yeah. But, um, aside from that, like if that doesn't bring you back to the faith, I don't know what will, because yeah the data is pretty overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's where, honestly, it's, I think it's where skeptical theism, like it, it sort of takes hold, right? Because it's like, you know, I, I use the example uh, and you may have heard me do it. I don't, I don't know. I use the example of the show monk, the detective show. Did you hear me give that example? No, no, but I'm curious now. Like, I, I, are you familiar with the, the, mm -hmm. the detective show with Adrian Shalhoub? Like one of my favorite actors. By the way, I love it. Oh, Adrian he's phenomenal, Kool. yeah. And, you know, every show, I, I think with almost without fail, some horrendous crime, usually a murder, starts off the episode, right? And as you watch it, y you know, <laughs> Adrian comes out and everybody else says, oh, it's clearly John, right? John killed him. Right. And Adrian kind of, you know, touches a light bulb. You know, does a little thing and he <laughs> says, it's actually Frank. He's the guy. Right. right. Everybody looks at him and says, Frank, Frank, he's dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> or he's in a coma, right? Or he's in outer space. Like there's no way that he, anybody could have done it except him. And right. You know, Monk says, no, he did it. And you know, as a fan of the show, if Monk said he did it, he did it. That's it. Had to, like, had to. You, you can hang your hat on it. And I think that's how we operate as believers, right? Right. So, like, we, we, we know the detective. We know the guy making the claim. And the thing is, Christians expect not just that God is right. They know that he's right. But they know that all the data, at least at one point or another, is going to look the opposite of the way that it should. Right. Because that's what happens at the beginning of a Monk episode. It's what builds the tension, right? It's what, it's what, it's what makes the show so great. And this is why Isaiah 5510 exists, right? This is why God's ways are higher than our ways. Of course. And, 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 and what I always say in, in, when I give this example 
because I, I tend I, I often give it to believers because they they understand it instantly. But what they don't understand is if you were to, or what I'm trying to get them to understand, is if we were watching a detective say, in that same circumstance, it's not John, it's Frank, but we didn't know we were watching an episode of Monk. There was mm -hmm. no way to tell. We're either watching an episode of Monk or we're watching a live news broadcast. That makes a huge difference. Because right. if we're watching a live news broadcast, you're saying, get that detective off the case. He's clearly got a vendetta against Frank. Oh, yeah. Right? But because we know we're in the show, we, we are able to suspend all of those you know, questions that we have because we, 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 know, we know the genre. And that's the same thing that's happening here. Atheists and skeptics and agnostics were saying, guys, we're watching a live broadcast right this is this is an actual detective out in the field like this isn't monk right and and if if they can just see it through that lens i think it makes it very clear why it is we hold the positions that we do right actually i had an atheist um that's such a good example but i had an atheist that says something like that to me when i was at the very beginning stages of my deconstruction and i was still doing internet apologies so back before social media, I was, uh, I don't want to tell anyone how old I am. I was on internet chat forums and um, uh, different websites debating people on religion and talking to Muslims and Hindus and whatnot. And I had a friend who was an atheist. That we became pretty close. And he said, Justin, have you noticed that all of your conclusions start with the idea that your God is real and that uh, the Bible is true? And then you interpret everything through that lens. He goes, but have you ever tried reading the Bible from the very beginning to the end without that conclusion? And just ask yourself after reading every page, is this true? Can I demonstrate it to be true? Or do I just believe it true because I already have my conclusion? And so I did. I went through the whole Bible that year and I read it. And after every page, I asked myself, do, is there a reason to believe this is true? Or do I believe it's true because I've already arrived at my conclusion? And he was 100% right. If you stop using your already held conclusion to interpret the data, it's very difficult to wrangle the text in a way that is sensible. Yeah. Um, but I think that is what apologist is. Apologist starts at the conclusion and goes back and says, how can we rearrange the data to still support this particular conclusion, no matter what the data is really saying? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's right. And I think... A showcase example of that is the you know the, the number six hundred thousand in Exodus twelve thirty seven, <laughs> right? Because well, like that's an impossible number given the data that we have of New Kingdom Egypt, and it's not my area of specialization, but you know here we are, and so okay, well LF must not mean thousand then, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it always reminds me, and I'll shut up, but it always reminds me of, you know, listening to Bart Ehrman when he talks about, you know, his like sort of enlightenment experience where he wrote that paper on some contradiction in Mark, and I can't remember what it was. And he he had, he had came up with this brilliant idea and he wrote this paper and and I can't remember which professor it was who handed it back to him and said, and it said on the back, Maybe Mark just got this wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, wait, is that an option? Like, <laughs> right. Of course. Can we say that? Yeah. Oh, gosh. On the, uh, the 600,000 plus fighting men, I actually had a, a friend of mine who's not really familiar with the Bible, but we were reading it together, mentioned to me. Um, he's like, but they, they just uh, executed most of the baby boys in Egypt not that long ago. So, um, and, but that, but there's still 600,000 fighting men, which means the population must have been absurd. Uh, like the general estimate is like two and a half million based on that, that number. But if it's true that they, some of these baby boys were getting executed, then the population, according to the text at least, could even be bigger than that. It could be up to yeah. 3 million, but the population yeah. of Egypt at the time wasn't even that. 
Yeah. And this is the, this is why I say when we can let go of this interpretive model, then it becomes super interesting right? because yeah. the reason the text is going to great lengths to talk about how many people there are and how massive they are is because Exodus one like lays that out. It's the whole fucking point. Right. They greatly multiply. There's so many of them. And the more they abuse them, the more they, you know, multiplied. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, right. Like that's, that's what makes the narrative so, so meaningful, right? It has that right. impact because that's why Egypt's scared. Because there's so right. many of them. That's why, you know, the people in Canaan are going to be scared because there's so goddamn many of them. Anywho. It's good anyway. storytelling. It's good yeah, storytelling. Right. All right. So I got uh, just one or two more questions left. And uh, we, we didn't go through all the questions because we were having so much fun talking about some of these sidebars, which I love. Um, yep. But I, I have a couple serious questions, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, when When people talk to me, sometimes I get people that are really in like the depths of despair. They're going through existential crisis. Um, they don't know uh, like what to do with their lives anymore. Was there anything that you found helpful when you were going through your deconstruction process with dealing with some of the big existential issues and like kind of reframing the way you're interacting with the world? Yeah, that's that's always been my most difficult struggle. Same. And something that Bart said actually was was really helpful. Um, and I, I'm not a New Testament early Christianity guy, so you know, forgive me. I'm 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 going to get the details of this incorrect, but there are apparently tomb inscriptions that say, I was, how does it go? Uh, I was, I am not, I know not. Right. Something like that. And even though I still wrestle with, in those dark moments, what if I'm wrong? What if sure. I'm wrong? For the most part, the realization that I wasn't aware before I was born and I won't be aware after I die. Right. It's actually very comforting to me. And because I think, I think this obviously hope for eternal life is th this fear of the end. Sure. Right. And while it's certainly not something that solves all the the issues, I think it does provide me some some comfort. The other thing that has helped is I realize that and this is going to be nothing novel, nothing that people haven't said before. But you know, just like Kohelet and just like Gilgamesh you know, just like, you know, so, so, so many that have gone before us have said that we, we get one, one go around here. And I think that this has allowed me the freedom to ask, who do I want to be? Right. Yeah. And like, what, what do I want that to look like? And actually, uh, I, I have a very good friend now, uh, but he was he was my therapist for a couple of years. Um, his name's Josh, and if people are interested in, eh, so you know he's ruggedly handsome. You know what Absolutely, I mean? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. How could you have that name and not be ruggedly handsome? But uh, he has a he has a uh, um, practice called Fostering Hopes, and or Fostering Hope. Fostering hope. I think it's fostering hope. And, but he specializes in post evangelical uh, right. deconstruction. And so he was very, very helpful because it, that those were the questions that came up, right? Like, well, Josh, you know, you now no longer have this framework that has been fit over you 
to tell you, here's what you, you need to hate these people. You need to love these people, right? Yeah. And even though they wouldn't say that, that's exactly what it is. Uh, you need to be fucking Jonathan Pritchett saying shit like, I'm not homophobic, but they're disgusting. Right. Yeah. I don't hate the sinner. I hate the sin. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, miss me with that shit. I just, I just, it's so frustrating to see dumbasses. Anyway, uh, I won't pull my punches with that one. <laughs> I'm with you on this. <laughs> but, you know, now that that, now that that mold has been lifted up, I think then it opens up the door to when I, when I look at myself, who, who do I want to be? What, yeah. who, what, what would make me proud of my behavior? What would make me proud of, of being me? And there were so many things that I did in my life that were, you know, remnants of behaviors that were remnants of the way that I viewed myself because of my evangelical upbringing. And I think once those things get shed, you know, once the cord gets cut and you can start to think through, why is it that I, I am so quick to serve people? I am yeah. so quick because that's, I'm a people pleaser to the core. Sure. Right? And I'm sure I, again, I'm not a psychology guy. I'm sure it's far more complicated than this, but it seems like a significant factor, at least for me, was that like, this is, this is what you do as a good Christian, right? As a, as a godly person, you always put everybody before you always, 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 always. And, and what that, what that, ended up happening for me is that, you know, I could always put everybody else's needs first because even if they didn't reciprocate, even if they didn't appreciate it, even if they didn't look out for my needs, God always would. That's right. You're building up your treasures in heaven. That's right. That always got credited to my account and God was never going to let more come on my plate, right? right? Than, than I could handle. When that goes, I'm still doing that. And so now the, now I don't have this, this reassurance yeah. that this is good. Where's wh this, where's this thing getting credited, right? There is no cosmic bank now building up for me. Mm -hmm. So now what do I have to do? Well, I have to manipulate people to get them to appreciate the things that I'm doing for them that maybe <laughs> isn't really my job to be doing for them. Right. Right. And so, you know, recognizing all of these things, has made me one somebody more tolerable to be around, and I could bring Megan in here, and she would wholly attest to that. I'm just kidding; she wouldn't say that, but she would think it. Um, but, <laughs> but, but you know, it it allows me to to be that better person by by the standards that that I think are more appropriate toward right. being a good person, living right. in a good way. Yeah, I like that. But I can't ground my instantiation of the necessary preconditions <laughs> that provide the possibilities of impossible, all possibilities of all being. So, you know, it's all shit. Sorry, well, Justin. Because the truth of the matter is, there's no such thing as a real atheist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's pressing that truth. It's pressing that truth. You know. All right, we we've gone we've gone over the hour. Uh, I'm sure we'll we'll connect again in the future. Yeah, so, absolutely. but yes, so I do go on. I, I'm on TikTok. I don't really make content on TikTok. Now that being said, I did briefly. I have another handle called Not Kent Hovind <laughs> because I do have a bit of a Kent Hovind impersonation. Uh, I don't know okay. if you know that. I didn't, but now I really want to see it in action. Yeah, well, Justin, let me tell you, uh, you know, here, uh, here, here, you're uh, one of these atheists, I understand. And, uh, you know, uh, you don't realize this, but uh, your your father was uh, obviously soup. Okay. And uh, here, uh, you know, we, uh, we we know that the water uh, rained down on the otters. Okay. And that's how cars evolved, the seven types of evolution. Okay. Uh, and you're probably friends with that godless engineer. He likes to talk about those 14 foot whale penises. Okay. Hey, he's pervert. Now I'm here to help. Okay. <clears throat> And then you just whack the atheists. <laughs> and then you just whack them. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was doing a stream one time with uh, Jimmy Snow. I don't know if you know Jimmy Snow's stream. He does the line. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, I know that. Yeah, okay. 
but he had, I think it was like a birthday party or something. And I was doing, they always asked me to do a couple seconds. I have a Hawaiian shirt and everything and some I mean, big glasses that I put on. That was spot on. <laughs> well, he said, uh, he said, can you read what I put in the, put in the private chat? I, he's got me. It's, it's on Paula Gia's channel. <laughs> He's got me going, oh, my money don't jiggle, jiggle. Uh, it folds, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Anyway, uh, um, so with with that being said <clears throat> and out of the way, right, yeah. uh, you mm -hmm. should open the whole the whole stream with that. Just just clip that out. No, just, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you want people to stop watching, maybe that's what you do. But, uh, <laughs> that's going to draw them in. Trust me, they love right. a good Kent Hovind impression. <laughs> But I have I have uh, my Kent Hovind rap up there on that TikTok, mm. so not Kent Hovind. Uh, I have a whole rap that I wrote and uh, a couple of Christmas songs, and you know, but it's not much content. But the reason that I come on with the Joshua Bowen account or whatever it's called is uh, I I I like going in live streams and right. sort of trying to aid in fact checking particularly right. things on the ancient Near East and the Old Testament. Um, I also go into an app called Clubhouse, if people are familiar oh, with Clubhouse. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. There's a, a friend of mine named Andrew, Andrew R., but I can't remember what his handle is. He's also on TikTok. He mm -hmm. just started maybe a month ago doing live streams on TikTok, but his bread and butter is, is in Clubhouse. And, you know, Andrew, I've said this to him, He's a fundamentalist evangelical Christian. He is the sweetest, nicest bigot you'll ever meet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I used to you know, be like, similar to you that. Know, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, I, he knows he knows that I would I would say that about him. Um, but yeah, so th those are places that I end up spending time. And if people are interested in knowing that that sort of thing, uh, obviously, Digital Hammurabi is is uh, Megan runs it. It's our main website, or it's our website. Right, uh, right. She's got a mailing list that all this sort of information goes out on. I teach Hebrew to, you know, lay Normal people. Folks. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we have a class now. Started off the first semester was twenty five. People went through the first semester. Uh, we're down to we're down to ten, I think, for the second semester. But we take you through Chong Leon Sales book, and so I, I teach I teach Hebrew. Got a middle Egyptian class going as well. Uh, yeah. So anyway, if you if you go to Digital Hammurabi, H A M M U R A B I, you can you can find all that stuff. Our books are up there as well. So, Josh, we uh, we absolutely love and appreciate you in this community. Um, your work uh, does not go unnoticed by uh, those of us. You get referenced all the time uh, during <laughs> debates, which is I don't know how I got like uh, pigeonholed into being the debate guy, but. Um, <laughs> somehow that <laughs> well that's the that's the i'm glad there are people like you that do it because if i don't have a partner mm. i just end up agreeing as much as i can with the person i'm debating mm. and if people watch that michael brown debate like right. that's what it was it was me and him and 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 in two hours of us going yeah you know i that's a really good point and let me let me build on that a little bit you know right. it, <laughs> it's uh that's why when i did that when I did that debate against Stuart and Cliff Connectly. Oh, my, that Stuart was a great Cliff. debate, though. But I had to have right. Matt Dillahunty as my partner because I could. It, it could be good cop, bad cop. I am a great good cop. You know right. what I mean? Right. But you I are. need a bad cop. I need a bad yeah. cop. And, I'm uh, definitely the bad, the bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll do some debates. So that would be a, that would be well, a good thing. Absolutely. We'll, we'll make it happen. I've got a couple of people clamoring to get me on modern day debates. Oh, um, and, but I, I'd rather not, um, uh, to debate formally because, mm. uh, to be honest, nobody cares about those debates. They just want to see the crossover yeah. where you question each other and you do your bickering. Yeah. And on TikTok, that's all you do. You just yeah. do the bickering. That's right. So <laughs> anyways, Dr. Josh, thank you so, so much. And we'll be seeing you around. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for having me. Cheers, brother.